Which one is this? That one? Oh, brilliant. Right, there we go. Okay, so um, good afternoon. I'm sorry, I hadn't realised that the screen for the length of this room is rather small, and I'm going to be showing some text, which probably you'll only be able to read about the first few um, uh, lines, but I, I, I will try and explain um, what is in them. So, uh, um, my focus today is um, going to be on the ancient views uh, and uh, of Nero and evidence for them. And uh, the... Um, I won't really be talking about the modern tradition so much, um, of which probably the, 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 the most sensible book is um, uh, uh, Miriam Griffin's um, book on uh, Nero, um, except to note that that mainly follows, most modern books follow the uh, Tacitian portrait and are therefore highly critical of Nero, um, and I think it's fair to say that Miriam's book is critical of Nero. Um, and, uh, and, and the books that are sort of say, you know, Nero, the great misunderstood emperor, are really on the loony side of uh, things. So uh, I, I'm going to try and give you a sensible view of Nero as possibly nice. OK. Um, <coughs> right. Sorry, I'm just, I should have checked where the things are. Good. Um, how, how many of you can read that? Where, can't, where do you start not being able to read it? Right, oh good. Okay, let's start with what Tacitus says about Tacitus's view of Nero, um, uh, which is uh, in his Annals, books 13 to 16, book 16, Beta's out, dot, dot, dot. Did he ever finish it? Did um, or not? We don't know. Basically, he, he explains at the beginning that the young Nero was lazy, he was indolent, and he was very impressionable. And so, you know, he did what, more or less what anyone told him. Uh, and uh, Agrippina tried telling him things, and then Seneca, and he says, uh, in fact, Nero was so lazy that he didn't write his own speeches. He was the first emperor not to write his own speeches. And uh, instead, he says, and I quote, Nero, right from his boyhood years, had diverted his lively mind to other things, engraving, painting, singing and driving horses. Now, I've always wondered about engraving, Kailara. You know, this is not a normal Roman aristocratic pastime, but never mind. Anyway, they, they, we'll come back to that. We will come back to that. Um, the basic story of Tacitus' account of Nero's reign is that in shortly after the accession, um, Agrippina, his mum, who's, who's organised his accession, uh, is trying to control everything, and she is driven out by Seneca and Burrus, and that once they have got Nero under control, then you have a number of years of good government. Then, for reasons that Tacitus changes his view about things, but in the annals it's because he wants to marry Poppea, he decides to kill his mother in AD 59. And after that, Nero's personal behaviour deteriorates. He starts doing more of his arty things and so on. But Seneca and Burrus, the idea is they're still controlling the government, until in AD 62, poor old Burrus um, croaks, and Seneca retires. And at this stage, two new people take over, his new wife, Poppea, whom he marries in AD 62, and the new Praetorian prefect, Tigellinus, and that after that, everything goes bad, because he's under bad advisers. Uh, and then, in the end, what happens is in 65 and 66, there's Pisonian conspiracy and its aftermath, and then he kills lots of senators, uh, and, uh, uh, and then eventually he himself, he goes off to Greece, comes back and uh, commits suicide. So basically the Tacitian portrait is of a young impressionable man who for, uh, uh, for five years is well controlled by Seneca and Burris and government is good uh, and it still goes on being good for the next three years though his behaviour goes downhill and then there's a change of advisors, uh, Poppea and Tigellinus and everything goes bad. Okay, now that's, um, that's the Tacitian view. There are other views. Um, the bad ancient view of Nero. Now, something that, uh, I'm glad Peter Wiseman's here, because it was he who really first pointed out, or I realised, uh, that the Octavia, it really is a very, uh, this play about Octavia, um, Nero's first wife, who is killed in AD 62, uh, was probably written uh, under Galba or Vespasian and performed <laughs> in AD 69 or 70, which means it is our earliest account of Nero. And what's quite interesting about that is that it is that some elements of the Tacitian picture are already in the Octavia. Agrippina is a bit mad, um, uh, Nero is a vicious tyrant, and the interesting thing is Seneca is there as an advisor but utterly ineffective. Okay? The, the, the best bad version of um, 
Nero, which probably draws on earlier ones, is Cassius Dio's, written uh, probably under um, Septimius Severus. And he says, uh, at the beginning, Agrippina controls everything. Then he agrees Seneca and Burrus ease her out. But they were mad to think they could control a wild young man by giving him concessions. And that after he'd murdered Britannicus, whether or not he had, Dio says, Seneca and Burrus no longer paid any detailed attention to public business, but were happy if, while exercising some restraining influence, they stayed alive. Now, this is Dio's, we're pretty certain this is Dio's own take on it, because Dio had lived through the reign of the young Commodus. And it is, and you get much the same story about Commodus. And this is Dio's take on it. You have a young something, something like a young Commodus, ridiculous to suppose that Seneca and Burrus could ever have controlled him. Uh, and then, and, and the other thing that's kept, um, note about um, Dio's portrait is that it does represent the anti seneca tradition, which we also find, you find in Tuscus, but tucked away into little corners. And so basically Seneca is bad. Um, he is uh, he, he's grasping, uh, he's hypocritical, uh, he urges Nero to kill Agrippina, and, and so on. And also, uh, one of the nice things about what, what Dio's picture, one of the best bits is, uh, the revealing which, uh, of, of the reality of what Seneca and Burris's position is, when Nero first performs privately in theory at this festival for the Juvenalia, sings, beside him stood Burris and Seneca like trainers, prompting him. And when he sang, they waved their hands and cloaks to give a lead to the rest. Right? In other words, they are, they cannot stop his performing, they have to support it, and indeed lead support of it. I think that's quite a nice little story. Okay. Uh, and, and then, oh, just, just for a little kind of numismatic break, uh, these are some coins from the beginning of the reign which show uh, Nero facing his mother Agrippina. This is the um, oak wreath he's awarded by the Senate for having come, um, come to power without killing any citizens, well, I mean, apart from, apart from Claudius. Uh, and, uh, and, and the obverse, curiously, has Agrippina's name and family details, uh, which is where you'd expect Nero's. And... The key point of this is to emphasise Nero's legitimacy, Agrippina is his link to Augustus. But anyone seeing these is going to think, you can see where the idea that she's in charge comes from. Okay? And that must have, uh, those coins stop very rapidly, of course. Uh, the good Nero, uh, there's quite a lot of sympathy for Nero in Greek literature, uh, which we'll come back to. Um, not in all of it, it's not consistent, but there is quite a bit. Suetonius's biography of Nero is a lot more nuanced than Tacitus's picture, or let alone Dyer's. He says, uh, um, at the start, he says, Agrippina ran everything. To Suetonius, Seneca is a, is a non-issue in the reign. Seneca is mentioned three times, each time as Nero's tutor, his educator, never to do with the government. And then about halfway through the, no, a bit before that, um, Suetonius breaks off to say, I have brought together these deeds, some in no way reprehensible, some even deserving of no little praise, in order to separate them from his bad deeds and crimes, which I now recount. So Suetonius sees Nero's reign as being a mixture of good things and bad things. And when you look at the chronology, there isn't a chronological break. It's not that all the good things are before 62 and all the bad things afterwards. It's a lot more complex than that. OK. Um, <coughs> and then there is the famous quote of Trajan, which uh, is preserved in the later, um, uh, the Epitome de Caesaribus, that all emperors have fallen well short of the five years of Nero. Proco de feri cunctos principes neronis quinquennio. Now, scholars <laughs> like to publish things, so there's an enormous debate of about 30 years ago as to which five years are meant. It's obvious it's the first five, isn't it? How could anyone think anything else? Well, never mind. Right, OK. Uh, now, who ran the show? This is just a... So, you know, what comes out of all this, What I, if I were talking about this, which isn't really what I'm talking about, I think Agrippina is still very influential unto her death. It's very difficult to explain why Nero would ever want to murder her if she isn't still in some way controlling things. There is no reason to think that Burrus and Seneca have, bro have broken with her. They, they were her tools, right? There is, what they do is very early on, they move her out of the palace, but it doesn't mean she loses her influence. It's, it's like not having her head on coins. You have the head on coins, people start saying she's running things. So you move her out of the palace, then they don't. Um, Tigellinus is not a new baddie in AD 62. Tigellinus had known Nero from his boyhood. Tigellinus had been prefect of the watch under Seneca, in the time of Seneca and Burrus. In other words, Tigellinus is part of the original gang. Okay. 
Seneca doesn't retire in 62. Uh, everyone says he retires in 62. Nero says, no, you can't. And he's still there and retires in 64. A little story about how Nero, when Nero did hear cases, what he did about them. Whenever he withdrew to take judicial advice, he never discussed anything in the group or openly, but read silently and kept to himself. In other words, when he reads people's views, he doesn't read them out. Normally, any ancients read aloud. Uh, the opinions written down by each man, and then announced what he had decided as if it were the majority view. Well, of course, of course, but the point is, he is not. He is taking advice seriously. He is considering that is you could say that's positive. He is making good use of his advisors. Okay. Right, so my view is basically that if anything happens in Nero's reign from beginning to end, it's primarily because Nero wants it to. It's not because Seneca and Burroughs are telling him to or Popeye is telling him to. It's because it's what he wants to do. And he uses people to help him. I'll start with the face of his accession speech to the Senate. He comes, uh, he, after addressing the gardens on, he comes into the Senate. All, all new emperors do this, and they all say, previous government was bad, I'm going to be much better. Right? And this is Nero's version of it. Then he outlined the shape of the coming principate, specifically rejecting what had recently caused, oh dear, typos, caused burning resentment. He would, under Claudius that is, he would not be the judge of all cases so that accusers and defendants were shut into one house. That's Claudius's uh, in, enormous enthusiasm for hearing cases himself. Uh, and matters were settled by the power of a few. There would be no conduit through his household for bribery or lobbying, no influence by freedmen or wives or things like this. Uh, his house and the state would be separate. The Senate would retain its ancient functions. Italy and the public provinces should attend the tribunals of the consuls, who would provide them with access to the senators, while he would look after the armies entrusted to him. And Suetonius sums it up. He said he would rule by the scheme of Augustus. And he is this is what we know as the settlement of 27 BC. But what's fundamental about the principle is the princeps looks after the provinces, allocated him by the Senate, the Senate does the rest. I mean, it's not that simple, but that's the, that's the message that's coming out. This is a new Augustan age. Now what I'm going to do is give you some examples of things where I think Nero was an extraordinary good emperor, and one who supported the Senate, which is above all for the Romans, is the crucial test of Roman literature. It's not what did the emperor do that was good for the empire, it's how well did he get on with the Senate? How far did he show respect? And I'll try to show you how Nero uses his undoubted dramatic abilities to make a really good go of these relations, which after all do require a little bit of dramatic um, uh, ability. And the first episode that I want to pick on, so I'm going to pick a number of, a few episodes, uh, some variety. Nero and the issue of freedmen. In AD 56, so Tacitus tells us, and by the way, anything that comes out of the Senate, senatorial business, is pretty likely to be correct because there were actor senatus, there was some sort of record, which does seem even to have included a sort of summary of major speeches and so on. So when Tacitus talks about what happened in the Senate, he, and, and there's a lot of reasons to think that he did actually go through and draw on the actor senatus. So this kind of stuff is, is quite good. There is a proposal put to the Senate that patrons should have the power to revoke their manumission of freedmen if those freedmen have committed crimes, fraudes, against them. And the frauds that people are thinking about, frauds means a crime. What the senators particularly hate is that freedmen, in, particularly in treason trials, have been testifying against them or even prosecuting their patrons, which is certainly something that they are not meant to do. You are not, if you are a, 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 a son, a wife, a freedman, and so on, is not meant by Roman law to testify against their husband, patron, or whatever. And that's the main thing. Um, the majority of the Senate, we're told, were very much in favour of passing a law that patrons should have the right to revoke many mission, but the consuls don't hold a vote, and we're told without the princeps knowing, ignaro principe. And so right to tell him the Senate's view. Now, this is a bit odd. I mean, OK, Nero isn't necessarily in the Senate, but you can't have a formal proposal without it being on the agenda. This is something we know. It actually has to be noted before the meeting. And you can't think that Nero and all his friends, and some of them must have been in the Senate, had not noticed this coming along. So I, don't, I find it very difficult to believe he didn't know that this debate was coming up. But clearly he hadn't expressed an opinion. And what is really extraordinary about this is um, that... Uh, sorry, Tacitus says after the accession speech, he then says, Nec de fides, 
And it happened. Nero kept his word. And this is an extraordinary example of this. I cannot imagine any other emperor allowing a debate in the Senate as to whether or not Friedman could be, um, could be manumitted without having expressed an opinion and saying what they wanted the result to be. And the Senate patently comes to the wrong, <laughs> to the, to the wrong decision, uh, very much in their interest, but uh, uh, would have been calamitous uh, for Roman society if patrons had had the right to revoke manumission at will. Uh, and Nero discusses this with his advisors, and then he sends a reply that the Senate could consider individual cases brought to it by patrons, but should not reduce the rights of all freedmen. This is something that senators kept on trying to do. They tried to do it under Augustus. They tried to, they tried to do it under Claudius. And here you see an interesting difference between Claudius and Nero. Claudius had said, no, you can't revoke that right, or you know, you can't revoke manumission as a general thing. You can't have a general. But he says, I will consider cases. Nero says, you can consider cases, right? See how he's respecting the Senate? Still on the on slaves. Nero and the slaves of Pedanius Secundus. In AD 61, the prefect of the city, a distinguished senator, is murdered in his house, uh, and, the, uh, and the Senate then dis, uh, decides uh, has to decide what to do uh, what to, uh, about punishing the slaves and freedmen in the house. Um, and it is a law, that is the Roman, Roman law, is that when a master is murdered in his house, that all the slaves who are in the same house, uh, they say, subeo odem tecto, under the same roof, have to be put to death. And the Senate, Nero Senate, had a, a, a couple of years, earlier, well, four years earlier, in AD 57, had by Senatus Consultum extended that law to include all the slaves who were due to receive manumission in a will. Right? So before, instead of you wouldn't execute the slaves who were manumitted in the will and, and, and they, would be, they would escape execution. So it's already been made worse. Right? The, the law has been tightened four years before. Now the trouble is that Pedania Secundus had a very large house and there were 400 slaves, pretty grosso modo there. And so the Senate has to, you know, there is a debate. Can we really kill 400 slaves? And, they, uh, and, and the, there is a great, um, uh, a great speech given by uh, Cassius Longinus. It's not, he presumably did give a speech. What we have is Tacitus' speech. It's the biggest speech in Annals 13 to 16. And it is unequivocally um, for executing all the slaves. And it seems to me it's fairly clear Cassius Longinus is the only person in Annals 13 to 16 who gets a positive write-up every time he appears. Everyone else is a flawed hero. He's not. So one, I think we must take it that this is Tacitus' view of the thing. Um, the uh, crowds gather outside and threaten to burn down the Senate in the Senate House because this is so unpopular a decision. Now, what would Nero do? You'd think, from the normal view of Nero, populist politician, hey, what he'll do is he'll override the Senate thing and he'll, and, and he'll achieve enormous popularity. What he does instead, remarkably, is that he vetoes the exile of the freedmen, which they want to have, but he then provides Praetorian guards to ensure that the slaves are taken off and executed without any popular uprising. So it's support of the Senate at a moment when really... You know, you do expect that what any sensible emperor would do is get all the pub, you know, get all the publicity and and, and so on. Um, there are two little things to know about this. T Tacitus and Pliny, certainly Pliny, had an experience of this themselves. In AD 105, a senator was found dead in his house. It wasn't sure whether he'd committed suicide or um, uh, been murdered, but they decided they had to decide what they were going to do. And in the end, they uh, and Pliny in his letter. Uh, makes a great fuss about he had proposed uh, a acquittal of the freedmen, uh, though in the end they get um, uh, uh, exiled, and presumably all the slaves are again um, executed. Uh, so we know that Pliny and possibly Tacitus, if he's around, had an actual experience of this. Uh, and the interesting, another thing is that we know that Seneca is in favour of mercy, because Seneca in his Naturalis Quaestiones, written after the Pedanius thing, uh, he with reference to this, approves the case under Augustus where someone had been killed by their slaves and Augustus deemed him to have been justly killed so it wasn't murder and the slaves weren't executed. And that's what Seneca... So we know that what Nero does would have been not what Seneca would have wanted him to do. Anyway, enough of slaves. Something rather different. Legal developments. Some of you may be involved in the law one way or another. You might like a little legal moment. Okay. In AD 61, another thing, the, uh, a number of senators and equites were convicted in the Senate of forging a will. And Nero uh, shows his 
his Clementia by interceding for a young noble who's involved, Arsenius Marcellus, he's very poor, that he should not be punished. And Tacitus does tell us that what then happens is the, um, the, the, the Senate proposes a new law against, because this is something that's involved, against the abandonment of prosecutions, especially if it's collusive. In other words, if you set up a fake prosecution merely to stop yourself being brought to trial. And this is a, a fundamental Latin uh, Roman legal, then becomes a fundamental principle of Roman law that's in the digest and so on. And it must be said, if you go through the digest, the number of senatus consulta about legal procedure that come from the Neronian period are more than from any other reign. In other words, the Nero Senate is enormously busy in reforming Roman law and laying down procedures which go right through to the third century. The thing that Tacitus doesn't tell us, rather curiously, uh, is that it also led to a change in the rules about um, tabulae, the, these tablets in which you record wills and contracts. That, um, that prior to AD 61, Romans had used two tablets, and so you'd, you'd write your you write your will thing in uh, your will inside you, then wrap it round, put your seals on the outside, and write a copy on the outside. And if you thought the copy on the outside had been tampered with, you'd break the seals and look inside. But actually, it was dead easy to slide something under the seals, take the seals off, and <coughs> alter the thing inside, you see. And so what they do is they devise the system of three tablets, where the seals, this is what happens with your middle, you have, so you have three tablets, and the middle one has a channel down the middle, which you put your seals in, and then your signatures beside them. And what you then do is you don't have a visible outside thing. You, this is all wrapped up so that if you want to look, if someone challenges your verbal thing, you unwrap the first, the, the first um, version of the contract or will. And that's still leaving this. And you can't get at the seals to tamper with them. And then if you don't trust the outer version, you can then break the seals. And this is a much secure thing. And in the, um, in, in the uh, tablets from... Uh, from Pompeii um, of the Sulpicii, uh, as studied by Camodeca, we find that almost all the tablets up to AD 61 are diptychs, and all the tablets after AD 61 are triptychs. And this is so a fundamental, another fundamental change in Roman procedure occurring under Nero's Senate. Lastly, I am an economic historian, so if you thought you'd get, a, get away without economics, you were wrong. Right, taxation even. <coughs> um, in, this is one of my favourite Neronian episodes. In AD 58, when Nero is consul for the third time uh, at the beginning of the year, for two, three months, something like that, uh, the following occurs, and I quote what Tacitus says. In the same year, following frequent demands from the people, complaining about the excesses of the tax contractors, the publicani, Nero wondered whether to order the abolition of all indirect taxes, Wectigalia, and to give that as his finest gift to the human race. However, after first greatly praising his grandeur of mind, his magnitudo animi, the senators stalled his initiative, explaining that the empire would fall apart if the revenues which sustained the state were reduced. So what happens is Nero then issues an edict, and probably with a senatus consultum, because one of the strange things is when we have inscriptions, almost everything Nero does is by edict and senatus consultum. And Tastus keeps on saying the princeps edicts it. And he's missing out that Nero, unlike Claudius, always gets the Senate involved in these decisions. Okay? And so Nero issues an edict which includes various things such as publishing official tax rates and their rules and, uh, well, we'll see that in a moment, abolishing invented surtaxes, extra charges, 2.5%, 2% and so on, and various other things which I'm not going to go into because these are the two that matter. Now... Most scholars have, you know, assumed Nero is a bit of a loony, and they thought, you can't imagine Nero in the Senate saying, oh, I'm going to abolish all indirect taxes. So a lot of editors have changed senatores to seniores, so that this is a little debate in, within, the, within, the, um, uh, within his, uh, his, his consilium, his advisors in the palace. I don't see why to do that. Nero's consul, it says senatores, if you think about this, this is a masterstroke of political, uh, uh, a political masterstroke. He stands up. If there are complaints about Wectigalia, Nero has probably already decided what he wants to do, one or two changes, and so on. They decide what they want to do. He stands up in the Senate and he says, I want to abolish all Wectigalia. And the Senate says, oh, no, you can't do that. You can't do that. And uh, well, I mean, what's his reputation after that? Everyone says, what a wonderful emperor. He wanted to abol abolish Wectigalia, and the boring old senator said, you can't do it. 
and, and then he does what he really wants to do and, and, and makes various uh, changes. And we'll see that this is serious because it goes on for years, this, this thing, and that's what I'm going to go on about now. Um, in AD 62, so four years later, Nero, and the uh, pastor says Nero appoints three senators to investigate indirect taxes. So this is still an ongoing issue. Um, and we have, we now have two examples of regulations published as was laid down in AD 58. One is from uh, Ephesus and is the uh, Lex of the uh, Customs Tax of Asia. And we now have one that is still not properly published um, uh, from Lycia, from the province of Lycia. So there was, under Nero, there were two emperors under whom tax regulations were actually published in some number and survived to us. And then Nero and Domitian, two bad emperors, uh, the good emperor Hadrian said it was no defence against the public calmness that there wasn't a copy of the taxes on display. Uh, right? If you don't pay taxes, you know, you can't use ignorance as, a, uh, as an excuse. Anyway, what this says is this is a copy uh, made in, uh, uh, in Rome or Ephesus on the 9th of July, 62, when Aulus Pompeius Paulinus Lucius Carpenius Piso Nanistus Genius Gemus were curatores of the public revenues by authority of Nero Claudius and by Senatus Consultum, right? So Nero had taken this through the Senate as proper. The standing regulations and so on. And then what they do is they, uh, the inscription gives us the regulations first set up by Gaius Gracchus in 123 BC, the amendments made by various consuls since, and then at the end where it breaks off, the amendments made by the curatores. So the point is that actually Nero, you know, is continuing the reform of AD 62 with actually setting up a group of three people to systematically go through all the tax vectigalia laws in the empire and produce up-to-date authoritative versions of the regulations and to provide copies which people that cities can then choose, as Ephesus chooses, to uh, put up in stone. And I don't think it stops there. Everyone know, uh, every, the other thing that people know about Nero is that he's kept on spending too much, which isn't true, and that therefore in AD 65, after the fire at Rome, he had to devalue the, pre the precious metal uh, coinage, the aureus and the denarius, to allegedly give himself more money. Now, this just doesn't work. It would take a hell of a long time when you're reminting these things to actually get any significant income from this. Also, what it ignores is that Nero had started reforming the coinage before the fire at Rome in AD 63, where instead of the mixture of bronze, so-called bronze, we call them bronze, mostly copper, copper and orichalcum coins before, uh, he starts minting a pure, uh, ori uh, all orichalcum issues for, for the minor coins. Uh, and this is a, a Dupondius, uh, which is quite interesting because it's, what it has, uh, it's got, uh, it's for, it shows something called securitas Augusti, the absence of trouble of the Augustus. And it's not entirely clear where it means that, hey, Nero's chilled or that the empire is protected by him. But anyway, um, what is striking about these coinage is that um, numismatists assure me that these are some of the finest Roman coins ever uh, produced in terms of the quality of their images and so on. And what is it that it does produces coins? Is it engraving? By a chance, remember Nero's interest in engraving? Anyway, so the coin reform is done uh, started before AD 63 and therefore cannot be simply a reaction to any financial problem in AD 64. Furthermore, I think uh, my own theory, and just to be brief, is that this is a recommendation of those treasury of the three men investigating wet to garnet. Remember one of the things, two things that I mentioned, uh, that, re that regulations should be published, that the extra taxes should be abolished. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of this, but prior to Nero, the drachma as a coin and the drachma as a weight have different values to the denarius as a coin, which is a weight. From Nero on, the drachma and the denarius have a parity. And we know this from all kinds of fascinating metrological texts that virtually no one ever reads. Now, the one, and, and what they do is basically um, the denarius is moved to being minted at, uh, at 96 to the Roman pound. Now, what I think is going on is the drachma, a, dra uh, 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 100 drachmas equal a mina. You can't go from 84 to 100 while preserving ratios very easily. So what Nero has done is he's moved the denarius 
to the nearest thing he can get to making the a denarius the same in the same relation to the pound as a drachma is to a mina, and we know that the mina is linked with the pound. In other words, what people can't do now is to demand a markup from people when they're paying in non-Roman silver coinage, of which there is an enormous amount in eastern provinces. And I suspect that actually this coinage reform is part of the reform of Wettigalia and is designed to eliminate the unjust charges. So, lastly, in the east, Nero is not popular just because of, uh, you know, he, he spoke Greek and he rode a chariot at Olympia and fell off it and so on. He's popular because he has made a really sustained and massive um, improvement to the uh, fairness of the collection of indirect taxes, which has always been one of the big, big, biggest bugbears of the eastern uh, provinces. And he was, uh, uh, and we have this edict of the prefect of Egypt of July 68, welcoming a new emperor to the city, and uh, with uh, and, and these things are always very rhetorical, but this is uh, this is more than most, uh, you know, placing your all your hopes and everything in your benefactor, the emperor, whose light has shone upon us for the salvation of the entire human race, Galba, the gods having preserved the safety of the inhabited world, the Oikumene, up to this most sacred point in time. Now, the only problem about this is that Galba wasn't going to go to Alexandria, never went to Alexandria, but someone was. After he, at the end of his Greek tour, Nero was planning to go to Egypt. And almost certainly because Tiberius Jesus Alexander got this whacking great edict out in record time, almost the day after he'd heard of Galba, right? So he must have had it written already for Nero, right? And this is, uh, this is the welcome speech for Nero to, to Alexandria. Okay, those are enough speculations. Thank you very much. <laughs>